chapter of Mark. Um, that was in this week's reading. If you remember, we've been reading through the New Testament. Hopefully we've been keeping up with that. And I'll begin reading there with verse number 13. I'll be reading again from the New Living Translation. Later, the leaders sent some Pharisees and supporters of Herod to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You are impartial and don't play favorites. You teach the way of God truthfully. Now tell us, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or shouldn't we? Jesus saw through their hypocrisy and said, Why are you trying to trap me? Show me a Roman coin and I'll tell you. When they handed it to them, he asked, Whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well then, Jesus said, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. His reply completely amazed them. Then Jesus was approached by some Sadducees, religious leaders who say there is no resurrection from the dead. They posed this question. Teacher, Moses gave us a law that if a man dies, leaving a wife without children, his brother should marry the widow and have children who can carry on the brother's name. Well, suppose there were seven brothers. The oldest one married and then died without children. So the second brother married the widow, but he also died without children. Then the third brother married her. This continued with all seven of them. And still there were no children. Last of all, the woman also died. So tell us, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For all seven were married to her. Jesus replied, your mistake is you don't know the scriptures. And you don't know the power of God. For when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. But now, as to whether the dead will be raised, haven't you ever read about this in the writings of Moses, in the story of the burning bush? Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So he's the God of the living, not the dead. You have made a serious error. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. You see, the truth is we can sometimes live in blissful ignorance of what God's word really said. Today we have the case of three different groups of people who did just that. We have the Sadducees, the Heronians, the, Sad uh, the Pharisees. Or did I say Pharisees twice? Sadducees, Pharisees, and Herodians. I'm not sure which order I said, but they were all living out this belief that they were all living good, moral lives, that they were doing the right thing, that they had the right understanding of Scripture. But what they had really done from the very beginning was they had already decided what they believed about God, what they had to believe in the Scripture, and they would just look for reasons in the Scripture to pull out, to enforce what they already believed. They didn't look to God's Word to allow change to happen in their lives. They weren't looking there that God really had dominion. They really didn't know who God was. In fact, that's the key verse, I think, in this entire passage. It ties everything together. Verse 24, and it says, Your mistake is you don't know the scriptures, and you don't know the power of God. See, they knew about God, but they didn't really know the true nature of who God is. In order to know God, we... We need to know his word, like the song was saying this morning for us, to know his word because his word is powerful. His word exists to transform our lives, to make us more like who God wants us to be, that his word challenges us, that for in our entire lives we are being sanctified, we're getting closer to who God wants us to be, that every single day, every week, every month, every year, we're learning something new, that in light of God's word, there's some aspect of our life that God wants to speak some truth into. And sadly, there are times when we don't allow God to do that because we kind of think, like the Sadducees, like the Pharisees, like those who are fallen Herod, we already know it all. And we just come to people with wordplay like these individuals are doing. You see, we've all grown up educated um, in this country that is becoming increasingly hostile in some ways to the things of God as a cultural understanding about who God is, that we come there, that even uh, people that are very devout Christians sometimes have wrong information because we don't take it from the Bible, we take it from the culture. And we just repeat back sayings and things that we've heard which isn't in God's word at all. The only way to overcome such ignorance is to study the word, to actually know what it says, to allow God into our lives to transform who we are, to allow false ideas to be broken by the truth of who God is. Amen. Thank you. 
We're replying to Jesus who is speaking to these people, but he's very much speaking to us today as well. And in this first section, we have uh, two groups coming together. Um, the Heronians, or the people who followed Herod, and the Pharisees, who are coming to question Jesus. And they ask him what they think is a catch-22. Um, they want to ask him a question, and the sole purpose of which is to trap him. Thinking no matter what he answers and how he answers, we've got him here. Um, the Pharisees, of course, most of you are familiar with, were teachers of religious law. They believed in the morality. They believed in the entirety of the Old Testament. But they were very much hung up on rules, that they were very much missing the heart of who God was. The Herodians were just people who really supported the, the dynasty of King Herod's. If you'll notice Herod, 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 several of them, they really believed in the political power of the Herods. And often, actually, these groups were often at odds. So it's a little bit strange that they would come together here, but it's most likely because, you know, the old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So they're both united in the thing that, here's Jesus. He is shaking up the establishment. He is changing what this culture is saying. But we don't like it because it affects us. It's changing the way people feel. He wants God's word to come in and transform people instead of coming to us who are these experts for seeking answers. And so um, they come to him. And at first we see in verse 14, they kind of give him like this little puff up, um, like this kind of fluff type answer talking about how great of a teacher he is and we know how wise he is and stuff. That's pretty much Jesus sees throughout because they're just trying to butter him up to trick him. You know, They're just doing it for shell. And, you know, Jesus isn't about shell. He's about substance. And so they ask them this question, should we pay taxes to Caesar? You know, should we or shouldn't we? Ah, so there's the rub, right? So if Jesus says, no, we shouldn't pay taxes to Caesar, he's a revolutionary. He is against the civil government. We can report him to the authorities. He can be arrested. Now, what if he says, yes, support paying taxes? Well, you know, most people, and particularly in this day, the tax system was very corrupt. These taxes were extremely unpopular. So he's supporting this, this government that was unpopular. And on top of that, the coins here that were paid to Rome basically were supporting the concept and idea of Caesar, the leader of the Roman Empire, was, a divine, was divine. He was a god, basically. And so he was supporting this pagan religion and offering them credibility. Because the people of Palestine have been paying a very number of different taxes, three primary taxes, um, actually, um, to the Roman government. The particular one that they're probably concerned about here is this poll tax, which was about equal to a person's days, um, a one day's wages for an average person that they would have to pay um, to the Roman government. And this was very unpopular. In fact, so unpopular, 25 years earlier, there had been a rebellion. Um, and that there was a formation of a political party called the Zealots. People sometimes still use that term, Zealots. And in fact, uh, one of Jesus' own disciples, um, Simon, was from this political party, Simon the Zealot, who came to find Jesus. And so this emotional issue, they think, okay, he's either going to upset the government or he's going to upset the people. But no matter how Jesus answers, we're going to trick him. We're going to step back and see someone's going to turn against Jesus. That is their agenda here. But instead, Jesus throws them for a loop because he doesn't really do either choice. Um, he asks for a coin. In this case, it was uh, Denarius of Tiberius. And on that coin uh, was stamped a picture of a Caesar Augustus who they believed um, came from a divine source. It actually read, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus, and on the other side, in Latin, said Apophis Maximus. And so that was rooted in this idea, again, that, that Caesar was divine, that his authority was the same as that of a god. But what he says to them doesn't really answer their question in holy, but instead shows them what real truth is about. See, what we think is this huge dilemma, how do you answer this question? You know, what, what do you say? He shows them that the problem wasn't even in how to answer. The problem is the question itself. It's really no choice here. He says to give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are God's. This coin says Caesar on it, so give it back to him. It's really of no consequence. 
but to give to God the things that are God. So many times we come to these things and we have questions posed to us by people and they're like, either or, this or that. When we find ourselves in that situation and we say, oh, I've got to choose between the lesser of two evils. Usually God doesn't have us choosing between the lesser of two evils. Maybe we're just making a false choice. That God has something else planned. He has something different in mind. As Christians, we're often challenged by questions that we think have no good answer. You know, we're Silly questions because uh, from the scholastic period of, uh, of scholarship, people used to ask lots of questions about God that were kind of silly based now, we see. They're like, could God make a rock so large that even he himself could not lift it? And people would spend serious time debating such topics. But the, the problem is the question itself is flawed. It's based on a premise that God is like human beings. And God doesn't have the attributes of human beings. So it's pointless. People ask that question because they're trying to point out either God isn't powerful enough to create such a rock or he's not powerful enough to limit the rock. So, so God is weak in some way. That's what they want God to appear to be. But the problem is they don't understand the true nature of God. God isn't like a human being. We can't attribute the same attributes to him. The problem is in the question itself. So these first two groups... They came to Jesus. They wanted to trick him. Didn't work. So now we have a second group kind of pull in the Sadducees. Now the Sadducees were also teachers of religious law. They were considered quite experts. The difference they primarily had with the Pharisees was um, they were a little more snooty often. They didn't believe. They were a little more academic. They didn't believe in things like the resurrection of the dead. They thought such things were wives' tales. They only believed in the authority of the first five books the Bible, the Pentateuch, or the Torah, or the books of Moses, you could call them, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And so they come to Jesus because they want to show him, Jesus, you believe in the resurrection of the dead? Uh, this is absurd, and we will point that out to you. So we pose this question. Okay, suppose there were seven brothers, because it says in the law of Moses, you know, if uh, someone can't bear a child and that brother dies, well then the other brother may marry that person and say, well, there are seven. They continue on and on and on through all seven people. Then they all die. Now, if there is a resurrection of the dead, when they're, when they're resurrected, well, who, who's going to be married to this woman if she was married seven times? You see how absurd that is, Jesus? <laughs> but again, the problem is in their question. They're asking something to which they don't understand. That's why Jesus tells them that their question uh, really isn't logical. It's, they're trying to trick Jesus into an indefensible position, but really their question is wrong. See, he tells them, see, the issue is um, you don't know. You don't know the scripture. If you knew the scripture, you would understand that your question doesn't even make any sense. Don't you understand that uh, when you at the resurrection, people aren't married or given in marriage. They're like the angels whose purpose is to gain the brother around and to glorify and worship God. Your question is wrong. It doesn't make sense. And in fact, I'll, I'll show you how it doesn't make sense because I will reveal to you from the own five books, the only five that you think are authoritative, I'll refer back to them and give you evidence of that. I'll talk to you about the time when God was talking to Moses. And he said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Not I was. I was formerly. It's clearly in the present tense. So Jesus is saying, you're thinking there is no resurrection. These people aren't alive. They're still alive. They're as alive as they ever were. Your problem is that you're thinking of it within the context of time. Of course, God exists outside of time. Those souls continue on. God is still the God of Abraham. He's still the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. You just don't understand what you're talking about. Just pretty harsh words for people who were supposedly great scholars who were trying to make Jesus look foolish. Sometimes we're confronted with such things today. They're like, you know, people would say, well, would you follow Jesus if he was lying? Well, it assumes a false premise. God can't lie. Jesus can't lie. He's the truth. 
light can't become darkness. And so they're asking questions that have no basis in reality. I think of a story that uh, Robbie Zacharias, the famous apologist uh, for the Christian faith, tells about when he was lecturing at Ohio State University. And he was taking phone calls, actually. And uh, one person called up, and they started uh, immediately yelling at him, like, why don't you believe in abortion rights? And he's like, well, what? we weren't even talking about that. But then they're like, well, then what is your position on that? And he's like, well, I believe in life. So then they start another round of question, and Ravi just interrupts them. And he says, may I ask you a question? Okay. On every campus I visit, someone always says to me how evil God must be. For example, a plane crashes, there's 50 people in it, 30 of them die, 20 live. Why is God so cruel to arbitrarily just decide 20 people live and 30 die? What kind of a God is that? But let me ask you a question. When we play God and we determine that a child inside a mother's womb should live, we argue that that is a moral right. So when human beings are given the privilege of playing God, it's called morally right. But when God plays God, we call it immoral. Could you explain that to me? And the caller hung up. You see, we have several different, different sets of criteria. And of course, also related to this matter, I'm sure that Robbie would have continued to, to point out that such things as the idea that we have that living here on this earth is the greatest good there possibly can be, and that death itself is always a bad thing. But Jesus always talked about that death as a continuation of life because Every person will perish. Everyone will die. Every single one of us. But that our time on this life is temporal. Because we were always made to exist on a different plane of existence. And so while none of us like suffering and pain, Jesus clearly experienced suffering and pain. You see, when we have people who come to Jesus, or we ourselves come to Jesus, and we think that we can be clever, that we can use some sort of wordplay to sort of trick Jesus with some false premise or ridiculous situation like marrying seven brothers and who will they be, God can come back and say, you don't really understand the scripture. You don't understand my true heart, my true nature, my true attributes. You know, so often the mistake that they made, again, is that they looked to find in the scripture the things that they already believed. They look for evidence. But Jesus is asking us to do the exact opposite. To be open to him, to read his word, and see my heart and mind is open to receive the truth that you want to tell me. And if I'm wrong, I'll change my ideas. I'll conform to you, but I need to be open to that. I don't get to dictate to God what I already think. Instead, opening myself up to that transforming life, because God is about relationships. He wants to know every one of us. And it sounds like from today when we were talking that there's a number of people who had rough weeks. I feel like I kind of had a rough week. And when we feel like we have a rough week, sometimes we can get down, we can get discouraged. But God is a God that wants to pick us up. He wants to embrace us and bring us close to him. And he can only do that when we embrace the truth the truth of who God is, because when we come to God, he transforms us to make us closer to him. You see, that's what God really, really wants. He wants us to know him and the power of his resurrection. We can know what the Bible says in a passage, like the Pharisees, like the Sadducees, but we can make it say what we want if we want to twist it. But Jesus isn't interested in that at all. He's not interested in us making the scripture say he wants the scripture to come alive in our lives. He, he, he didn't give us his word so that we know facts about him or information so we sound smart or can debate well. He's interested in speaking the truth into our lives so that we can know him and that in knowing him our lives feel more complete we can experience i hope what sue was talking about that feeling and presence of god that at various moments we can feel his presence and take that with us wherever we are 
And one of the reasons, hopefully, that we gather together to worship is to feel his presence, to encourage each other, to build one another up. So that as we leave here, we take that truth. And there's, there's no shame in not knowing everything about God. But there is a real shame in being prideful about our ignorance of God. And that's what these groups were doing. They were prideful about their ignorance of God. And it is so important for us to learn and to continue to learn more about God so that we can take that out. Because I know what God's desire is for all of us, that we would know him more intimately. That's what he wants. Not just read, but allow him to change us, to transform our lives, if we allow him. Let us pray. Father God, you are good to us. There are times in our lives when we get down. There are times when we are frustrated. There are times when we hurt. There are times when we don't know where to turn. But you have never let us down. Sometimes we have let you down. Sometimes in our hearts we outwardly say we want to change, but we don't. We don't really want to be challenged. We don't really want to conform with what you want. And this must make you weep and just cry at how foolish and arrogant and prideful we can be. But Father, we ask that your will would be done. God, help our hearts to want to know more of you, that we don't want to just play around with your word, but we want to live your word. Help our hearts desire more of you. Allow us to be humble and accept more of you in our lives. Help us not to play word games with you, but be serious in our relationship. And those things that hurt us and harm us, those things that we're holding back, help us to feel your warmth and your love, that you're not trying to shove us away, you're not trying to push us away because uh, we've hurt you, we've done something wrong, but if we turn to you and we say sorry, you are embracing us and loving us and bringing us closer to you because your desire is always to know us more. You're not vengeful. You don't keep a record of wrong. You're kind and forgiving. And God, let us feel that forgiveness today. And let us feel your warmth. And let us feel more of your presence that we may take it out of here and show it to a world that desperately needs you. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen.